is on uh, clothing this morning. The first was this morning when, uh, when I was getting ready. My son, uh, Philip, was, was asking me, Dad, when are you going to get to change into your other shirts? And I was like, what do you mean other shirts? He means the Aloha shirts. You know? He's like, I'm wondering when I get to change into those too. But I thought it probably after Memorial Day service. So, so those of you who have already Aloha shirts on, great, great. Glad you can get ahead of me on that. But uh, yeah, I, I like those Aloha Aloha time or Aloha time of the year. Um, but the reason I dressed like this, the other conversation was um, before during the Sunday school or right before the Sunday school assembly time, a person came up and goes, Are you going to a funeral today? Oh, yeah. <laughs> because the way, and he was right, because uh, after this, I, I'm rushing over to uh, Richard Weathers' uh, celebration of life service. And um, so um, some of you know him, some of you don't know him, but um, that's at one o'clock in El Cajon. So I'm giving you that as a warning. If I feel like I'm rushing or going away or something really quickly, that's the reason. So <laughs> please forgive me for that if I seem rude after the service. But let me pray once again as we uh, get into the message. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we give you praise. And what a, what a joy it is to, to know that you love us so dearly and as was shared already that uh, knowing our limitations, knowing that Yes, we need a law, we need standards by which to live, but, but which we cannot keep. That you sent your son Jesus who perfectly, completely kept the law and therefore was able to pay for our infractions, our limitations, our inability to fulfill that law. That Jesus fulfilled the law and that through Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf, that we are made righteous in your sight. And so we are so grateful uh, for your doing and for the new covenant of Jesus' blood, it says, that brings us into this right relationship with you. Help us as we think about this a little more uh, through today's passage in Hebrews chapter 8. We ask your speak, that you would speak to us and give us understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So when we're talking about... Um, the mentioned are about Old Covenant and New Covenant. We're really talking about what I would consider good and better. The Old Covenant's not necessarily bad, right? But we want to think in terms of good and better. How many of you like better? Like, do you like better? Well, let's let's think about this a little bit, you know? I think we all like deals, right? You like deals? So, here's a good deal, right? Two tacos for $5. I mean, wouldn't you agree, like, five tacos for $5 is the better deal? Yeah? Yeah. You like good or you like better? Okay. How about 50% off? That's a good thing. But how about 90% off, right? That's better, right? Yeah. So that's what we're trying to think here in terms of this. Is, is, huh? How about free? You know, I learned in, yeah, well, I learned in uh, college and you can ask this, there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? And so, um, and sometimes you, well, never mind. We won't get into this. Why am I talking to you about the things? All right, so I, I've had experiences where there was nothing more expensive than free. But anyway, so, um, but yeah, we're looking for good versus better. And in our lives too, right? We, we might have a good marriage, but don't we want better marriages, right? Or we might have something good for us, but we want better. We want what is better. That's what, and then ultimately, God is the one who provides what's best. But so I want you to think about this as we get to this message today that we're thinking about and we're talking about something that's better. And the thing is that we're talking about a better covenant. We're talking about the old versus the new and we're talking about a better covenant. Now, as we've been uh, studying the book of Hebrews and, and we saw that uh, the people that it, this letter is written to are Jewish believers. Jewish believers who are concerned with the persecution that they are receiving, mainly probably at the hands of their own people, the Jewish people. And so they are thinking of returning back to Judaism because of that. And, and the writer of this uh, letter to the Hebrews is telling them, let's think about what you're, what you're saying here. Because let's look at the main tenets of the, the Jewish faith and, and, and see if Christ is better than these things. And he has talked about Jesus being greater or better than, or superior than the angels, Jesus being superior than Moses, and Jesus being superior now than the Levitical priesthood. And we're talking about the Old Covenant here. 
and the Levitical priesthood had its limitations, and, 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 and the author then brings in this, this guy by the name of Melchizedek, and that Jesus is part of this order, the order of the priesthood of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, as we read last year, he was a king of Salem, right? He was a king of righteousness and a king of peace. And he was a, a priest of a high priest of the Most High God. He worshipped God. So uh, what we read there towards the end of chapter seven are these things. It says, "Now if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron?" So the question is, is if it was good, if it was perfect. Why would you have to replace that? That's the question there. Verse 12, for when the priesthood is changed of necessity, there takes place a change of law also. What was there existing with the old covenant, which is the Mosaic law and everything, now with the new priesthood, we have a different law. Now some of those things are still there, the moral aspects of the law, but we call it the law of the Messiah. That's what we, we talk about when we're talking about Jesus. Goes on. For on um, the one hand, there is a setting aside of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness, parentheses, for the law made nothing perfect. And on the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. We look at this passage, we see this word better quite a bit. We have a better hope through which we draw near to God. Verse 20, and it's inasmuch as it was not without an oath, for they indeed became priests without an oath, but he with an oath through the one who said to him, this is referring to Jesus, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. So much the more also Jesus has become the guarantee of a, what? Better, Better covenant. And then it goes on to say, for the law appoints men as high priests who are weak. But the word of the oath, which came after the law, appoints a son made perfect forever. And so the whole point in this section has been about Jesus being greater, being better than the Levitical priesthood. And his priesthood is not of the Levitical. He's not a Levite. He's from the line of Judah. And there is no mention of any of these people from Judah becoming priests. So where does his order come from? And that's where this Melchizedek thing comes in. And the mention in Psalm 110 that the Messiah was to be of the priestly order of Melchizedek. And so all of that is introduced to in here to say that Jesus Christ is the mediator of a better covenant. A mediator is someone who works in between, right? He's the one who brings things about and talks up on both sides to make, make things work. And he is the mediator between us and God, right? And he has brought about this better covenant. So we go into chapter 8 today and we continue on. The author writes, now the main point and what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. A minister in the sanctuary and in the tabernacle, true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not Man makes it very clear here that Jesus, as our high priest, ministers in heaven. His tabernacle is in heaven. None of us could uh, mess that up. None of us could touch that. It's, it's the holiest of holy places. He enters in to the very presence of the God Almighty. I mean, he is God himself, but the Father. And he is interceding on our behalf. So that is the great thing that we know about Jesus. He is not in this sanctuary or a tabernacle made by the hands of men. We know what happened in Jerusalem in AD 70 when the temple was destroyed and everything. Uh, we, we know these facts, that those things that man makes eventually will be destroyed, will disappear, but not the things of God. And that's where Jesus is, and he is ministering there. Verse 3, for every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, so it is necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, 
he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law. In other words, if he was here, he doesn't fit into the plan, right? With the Levitical priesthood. Who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle, for see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which is shown you on the mountain. It goes on to say, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. Let me go back to this part. So we see here the things that whatever that God is told through Moses, make it such, do it such, those are just types. Those are just shadows of the greater thing, of the reality of which we see in heaven, right? Uh, there's a wonderful uh, illustration of these things when you read through the Chronicles of Narnia with, um, uh, you know, by C.S. Lewis. I think especially in it's the uh, uh, Silver Chair, there's that one scene when uh, they're, they're discussing things in, in that uh, underground, underground world. Uh, I'm going tangent, I know. But anyways, read it yourself because there's a wonderful... A dis, dis, uh, discussion here about the things above and the things below, you know, that kind of a thing. And the things on this earth versus the things in heaven. And the things that are in heaven, the reality and that they're more brighter and they're more greater and they're more better and, and vibrant and, and alive and all those kind of things. And so whatever we have here, the tabernacle, as good as it is, the tabernacle in heaven is the real deal. It's better. That's the, that's the idea here that is described. And thus, we understand that Jesus has a more excellent ministry where he is the mediator of a better covenant with better promises. But Yuki mentioned, as she was talking about, when we think about a covenant, we think about promises. The promises that God has given to us through the new covenant, they are better. They are based on, as was indicated too, an unconditional covenant. That God on his part has said, this is what I will do. And he will do it. Whereas in the old covenant, there are a lot of conditions. If you will do this, then this. If you don't do this, then this. But with the new covenant, the promises are in many ways one-sided. Because God has says, this is what I will do, and he has accomplished it for us, as we will see. So we see with the old covenant that, that it was inadequate for us, that it had some issues, it was not perfect. It, and the author talks about this, starting in verse 6, says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. The point is, if that was a one-done deal, then there would be no need. Or we wouldn't be even discussing a new covenant. The old covenant would not be old. It would be the covenant. But we have an old covenant because now we have a new covenant. For finding fault with them, he says, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect the new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. Notice the time in which that the old covenant was made. It was made with their fathers as the people of Israel as they were leaving Egypt. That is the, remember Exodus, right? Remember that with the Passover lamb and the final thing? final deal with there were the ten plagues and, and the final deal, the firstborn was going to die and after that with the Passover, finally the Pharaoh, Pharaoh relented and said go, get out of here, right? And it was at that time that we have this covenant now being instituted, so that's what's described and talked about here. Now the real issue with the old covenant, or more specifically the Mosaic covenant, was that it could not save people from their sins. It could show us our sins. It could show how weak we are. It could show how unable we are. It shows us how we should live, but it could do nothing to make us live that way. And it could do nothing to take away our sins. That was the real issue. And this new covenant was introduced, and as is quoted here, it's actually quoted almost verbatim from Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. 
And, and that's what uh, the author is doing here in chapter 8 of Hebrews is he is bringing that passage on the new covenant into this and he's talking about these things. And according to Jeremiah and according to this passage, the new covenant is made not with the church but with Israel. I want to make this very clear because there's a pro problem that we have as, as, as people living today and we love the Bible, we, we consider the Christians, you know, main holy scripture and it is but we have a tendency to automatically claim everything for ourselves. But we have to understand that these things are written at certain times to certain people. And we need to understand that and respect that. It is very important. So we can't just claim every verse in Scripture and say, oh, that's, that's for me. It doesn't always work that way. And so according to this passage, it makes it very clear that it is to the house of Israel, to the house of Judah, the whole whole. You know, 12 tribes of Israel, that's, that's what it is. But, so it's not made to us. However, and well, why are we discussing this? Because it does have relevance. Verse 10, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me, from the least to the greatest of them. Now in this passage, it talks about the fact that we will not have to teach everyone that we would know the Lord, that we would know His commandments. But more, this is more expanded for us in Ezekiel. In Ezekiel 36, talking about how this is done, it says, Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Notice that it is the work of the Holy Spirit that is talked about here. Hitherto to that time, the Spirit of God obviously has been at work, but it has been working. It would come upon people like in the instance of Samson and he would have the strength to do all those you know, mighty deeds and things. Uh, um, but the spirit would not be inside a person. It would not be working or indwelling within the person. But this is the promise of the new covenant that God's spirit, the Holy Spirit, would indwell us, would come into us. And that's the relationship that we would have. So the church now, which includes both Jews and Gentiles, enjoy the spiritual blessings of this new covenant. Because I know, I know the spirit of God is at work in me. I know that the Spirit of God is at work in believers, whether they are Jews or what we call Gentiles. And the promise was given when the on the day of Pentecost, as we saw, when the, uh, when the Spirit was poured out, and, and Peter in speaking in Acts chapter 2, he said that this promise of the Holy Spirit is given to everyone who believe, believe in Jesus Christ. And so that is the promise in Romans uh, 8 that expands upon those things about the Spirit of God at work in our lives. And it is only by the Spirit that we can cry out to, the, to God, Abba, Father. And so we know it is by the Holy Spirit. And that Spirit indwells all believers. It doesn't matter whether you are a Jew or you are a Gentile. But there are other promises in that new covenant that you know, in a physical sense that we do not enjoy, but the spiritual blessings are for all of us. It goes on to say, for I will be merciful to their, to their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. What a promise. And in verse 13, it says, when he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete, but whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. That final commentary is there to say that we move on. We move on from the old covenant. We're moving on to the new covenant. And that's where our focus and our hope should lie in. The new covenant promises the complete atonement of our sin. And it was put into effect by Jesus when he went to the cross to die for our sins. It's interesting because the first, the old covenant, when it was brought into effect and and one of the things, that the first things at the beginning of that is the Passover, right? And when you think about the Passover feast, that was instituted at the beginning of the, 
Old Covenant, it's interesting to note that the Passover feast celebrated by Jesus, the final one, or what we call the communion in a sense, was the prelude to or the introduction into the new covenant that Jesus was, was bringing about. And so we see in Matthew 28, uh, 26, I'm sorry, as it describes that last Passover feast, this is what it, it says. It says, while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. We see here that Jesus explained clearly as this was representative of what he was going to do, right? We celebrate it now as something he has already done, that we, we continue to do the communion in remembrance of Jesus' death on our behalf. But this is before he went to the cross. He explained to them, this is exactly what is happening here. When I go to the cross and my body is broken for you and my blood is poured out, it is being poured out for this new covenant with you, that your sins are forgiven, that when he cried out, it is finished, the work of for our redemption was accomplished, that we are made righteous in God's sight through the perfect work and righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's the good news of the new covenant. It is better. It is something that we now, as Gentiles, uh, those who are not Jews experience and enjoy that part of the blessing as well. And I like that last part where Jesus promises not just that I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day. Uh, that's not it, but it says, but day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. There is this relationship that is talked about here. And so the glory of the new covenant, the blessing of that is that communion is a continual reminder to us of the new covenant in Jesus' blood and that we have been set free from sin to live as children of the King. Isn't that awesome? Because everything that we read in terms of the Holy Spirit in our lives is that it's by the Spirit that, that we know that we are children of God. It's by the Spirit that we can live as the children of the King. It's by the Spirit that we can have the qualities, right? The attributes of the King. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. All those things that, uh, that God uh, is, he, he promised to us as fruit of the Spirit of God. And so that is, that is the awesomeness that we have in this, through this new covenant. I want to just end with this, is that those who are wondering, well, how do I become a child of the King? How do I become a part of that new covenant? And how do I know that it's not just about for the Jews, that it's available to, to me as well? Uh, Jesus, uh, this is a, in, in John chapter 1, in talking about this, this uh transaction or, or this uh, work of God in our lives and bringing us to a point of being a child of God. It says, but as many as received him, that is Jesus Christ, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. It makes it very clear there. And then it goes on, verse 13, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. In other words, it doesn't matter what background you have. It doesn't matter what upbringing you are. It doesn't matter if you have Jewish blood in you, you have Japanese blood in you, you have American, whatever. Is that it is not even done by human blood. It is done through the blood of Jesus Christ. That by believing in Jesus, believing in the fact that he died for your sins, 
and that he rose from the dead, and that he is Lord, he is God, he is your Savior, that through him you will be a child of God. Because when you do that, you receive that promise of the new covenant, which is the Holy Spirit of God being born into your life. Isn't that awesome? Can I hear an amen? It is a better covenant, and we are, should be thankful for it. And Jesus is the one who made it all possible. Next week, we'll look a little bit more at the better things of these things that Jesus is doing. But just to remember, the better covenant that Jesus has brought in through his perfect life and his sacrifice on our behalf. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the blessing of being in this relationship with you. When we think of covenant, we think about often marriage, we think about different transactions. Sometimes we think we have a good deal, some things we think it's not a good deal or bad deal, but we know this deal is the best deal, it's the real deal, because it's, a, it's an eternal covenant. It's a covenant that lasts forever, and it's a covenant that we know will never be broken because you are faithful and because the covenant has been sealed already through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And we thank you that those who believe in your son Jesus, that their relationship with you is sealed through your Holy Spirit. Again, not that we do, but you do, that you give to us. What a one-sided kind of deal this is, that you do it all for us. We are so grateful. But Father, we pray that we would be people of faith to be able to humbly accept your grace, your love, your mercy, your forgiveness, and the salvation of eternal life through Jesus Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name.